Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my pleasure to be here to talk to the group. Um, presenting to patients and caregivers um, is something that I do pretty regularly. Um, I actually run the support group in Jacksonville. Um, we used to have a patient who was in charge of running the support group, and uh, they some life circumstances didn't uh, weren't conducive to them continuing to do it. So, so I took it over myself. Um, so. Every other month on a Saturday afternoon, I show up and talk about myasthenia gravis for two hours. And, um, you know, I, I show up in shorts and a T-shirt and, you know, no socks, berries, uh, you know, we, we live in Florida. Um, I don't shave those days, you know, they, they come to see me. I'm usually, you know, I don't usually wear a sports coat at, at work. I usually wear a tie, but I don't usually wear a sports coat. But I say, you know, you come in that day, don't expect to see me in that same attire that you see me when, you're, when I'm uh, dealing with you. Uh. Now, do I have a slide advancer thing? Yes, I do. Here it is. Okay, good. So um, I was asked to talk to the, today about what's new in MG clinical trials and treatment. And um, I like to say that uh, I have a connection to Duke as well. I did my residency at Duke, and I, I think my passion for this disease was sparked uh, by Dr. Don Sanders at Duke University, who at the time um, was probably the, one of the biggest researchers and clinicians in the field of myasthenia gravis for quite a, a number of years. He's just finally, I think, stopped seeing patients. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but Don is still act actively involved in the Myasthenia Foundation uh, on the board and so forth, so, um, you know, uh, that's, that's where I got my interest when I went when I went into practice in Jacksonville more than 20 years ago now, um, I expressed an interest in myasthenia. I met with the local chapter at that time of the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation. There's a guy named Jim Burke, and I have kind of lost touch with Jim over the years, but I went and spoke to their support group and um, basically showed them how, how passionate I was about this disease. And uh, so he started referring a lot of people to me. And so, I owe a lot of uh, my sort of expertise to Don Sanders and to Jim Burke and the Myasthenia Gravis Foundation. So, um, and, and along those lines, um, as far as new treatments, um, Don Sanders actually invited me to be a participant in one of the first clinical trial, well, the first clinical trial actually that I participated in as an attending physician, uh, which was for Cellcept um, way back when. And that helped me make a lot of connections in the, in the myasthenia world. And actually, there's this reception they're doing uh, for Dr. Sanders, um, at, I think at the American, American Academy of Neurology. And I'm not going to be attending, but I, I actually sent in a little thank you to him that I hope they'll be able to share. So, um, so everybody knows about the, the disease. This is sort of the cartoon of the connection between the nerve and the muscle. Um, so... In a normal situation, when an electric impulse comes down your nerve, there are these containers of acetylcholine that are dumped out, and they go over to your muscle, and they bind onto the acetylcholine receptors, and that's what makes your muscle contract. And every single time a nerve impulse comes down, it dumps out enough acetylcholine, and you have enough receptors, and the muscle contracts every single time. In the situation in myasthenia gravis, you have the antibodies. And they're blocking some of the receptors, they're destroying some of the receptors, they're damaging the muscle. And so now, when you dump out the acetylcholine, you don't get a, a response from the muscle. And that's what causes the weakness. Every single, there's, there's millions of these connections in your muscle, between the nerve and the muscle, and every single one of them is all or none. Either it happens or it doesn't happen. And so when it doesn't happen, then you, then you get weakness. So um, we've been using a lot of the treatments we have for quite a long time, but just recently there's a lot of really exciting new developments in treatment of myasthenia gravis. And so I'm going to talk about one aspect of this, which has to do with um, part of the immune system known as complement. And then Dr. Raja will talk about the other part called the FCRN. And these two targets um, have led to quite a bit of research, uh, clinical trials. Um, a good thing is that there's a lot of competition among drug companies that I hope is going to um, make 
the development of these, these treatments as good as they can be for patients and hopefully uh, help to reduce some of the costs involved in them and that kind of thing. So I'll talk about complement now. And uh, it's kind of a complex system in the body, um, but the, the purpose of having this is to kill things that we don't want to have in our body, like bacteria, for instance. So when the immune system recognizes some foreign object in the body, you'll have antibodies um, that can form against it, and it activates this pathway. When this pathway gets activated, it inserts things into the, the cell that, that it's trying to attack and forms basically a hole in the cell. It allows lots of water to rush into it, and it bursts the cell, kills the cell. Now, unfortunately, what happens in autoimmune diseases is the same thing is happening. So the acetylcholine receptors that I showed you back here, um, binding onto the muscle, they can activate that same pathway. And instead of killing a foreign bacteria, now we're killing muscle. Um, and not only is it, are, we, are we having some blockade of the receptors here, the muscle's actually being damaged. You see how this, uh, have this has this appearance that it's, it's got like little up, up and down folds in the muscle. And when you look at what happens in, um, in myasthenia gravis, you, um, you start to lose some of those folds. So here are the folds in the, in the muscle. And then when the complement comes in, now it, it becomes much more of a flat uh, surface, and you don't, have as, you don't have as many receptors. And this, this actually increases how many can be in one little tight area by all those folds, so that it really amplifies the signal. And when you don't have that, even if you have some receptors, you don't have that amplification of the signal like you would have when it's folded like this. So this pathway has been shown in animals for many years to be important in, in patients with myasthenia gravis. So um, I had a discussion recently at, at a meeting um, about whether it's active in everybody. Um, I think in animal models, it seems like it's almost 100% of the time it's involved. I don't think we know for sure in human beings whether it's involved in everybody. Um, so will drugs in this pathway help every single person who has myasthenia gravis? Probably not. Um, I think it's, it has to be something that is clearly active in that patient's disease process in order for the drug to really be doing anything. So um, <clears throat> the drug that they're producing is a drug that blocks this pathway, basically. So we have antibodies in myasthenia gravis that are attacking the acetylcholine receptor. Well, we can produce antibodies. They're called monoclonal. Mono means one, and clone is like a, you've heard of cloning you know, genetically. It's cells that are genetically identical, producing only one particular protein, this one antibody. And those monoclonal proteins can be, you can um, engineer them, so to speak, to go after certain things, and in this case, there are antibodies that are going against this part of that, that cascade that we were showing earlier, that whole big pathway. It's kind of the, one of the key steps in it is this part that's called C5. And so if you block that part of it, it doesn't go on to the end result and punch the hole in the cell. So that's basically what's going on with this. It's a monoclonal antibody that binds to this C5 part doesn't allow the next steps to happen in the complement pathway, so you don't get the holes in the muscle membrane. This is stopping the damage. It's not repairing the damage. Whenever you, know, whenever you take drugs that suppress the immune system in myasthenia gravis, the, the drug is not fixing the problem. It's allowing your body to fix the problem. It is you know, um, interfering in the continuation of the autoimmune disease process and allowing your body to fix the damage. It is not directly fixing the damage. 
And that, the, that goes for IVIG, it goes for plasma exchange, it goes for all the different treatments that we use that impact the immune system. <clears throat> so, um, the drug is called Soliris, S-O-L-I-R-I-S, -I -I and the generic name for it, this long name called Eculizumab. Um, they did a pretty large study with 125 patients. I was one of the sites that was involved in this. Um, interestingly, before this study, there had been another study. In that study, they did what was called a crossover design, and they had a hard time recruiting people. Back in the day, we, we really struggled to get people to enroll in clinical trials in myasthenia gravis. Um, people would say, I, why do I want to go into a study where I'm going to get a placebo? Because there's Cellcept, and there's Imuran, and there's all these treatments, and I'm going to you know, wait until I've used all those. Well, basically, everybody who went into these studies had already done all those treatments. They were what's called refractory. They've been, they've tried, they had to have tried at least two different immunosuppressive drugs to get into this study. The first study, they had a really hard time recruiting people into it. It only had a small number of patients. Um, and the crossover design that they used, so they took, either you got the real treatment or you got the placebo, and then whichever one you didn't, after a washout period, you get switched to the other one. Well, what they didn't know was the effects of this drug were going to last longer than they thought, which messed up the ability to analyze the second part of the study. But there was a lot of evidence that, that there was some activity of this drug, that people were really getting dramatically better. And even though the study didn't get as many people, it was, it was very exciting and very um, suggestive this drug is going to work. And it, I think patients heard about it and physicians heard about it and said, we really need to do the big study. And that was this study. So, um, so for 26 weeks, half a year, they were either getting a placebo or, or the real drug. And they weren't allowed to change their other medicines. Whatever else they were taking at that time, they had to stay on those treatments. They could be rescued if they needed to be. They get you know, plasma exchange or IVIG or something like that. Um, and then in the second part of the study, if you happen to have been on placebo before, now you can get on to Soliris. And if you're already on Soliris, you can stay on Soliris. And almost everybody went into this extension, 117 out of 125 people. And so, you know, almost all of them did. Um, and they're pretty typical patients. Um, Two-thirds of them were women. 20% um, were over 65 years old. They'd had myasthenia on average for about nine and a half years. Um, and uh, as we've seen in almost every study, um, females tend to get the disease at a younger age, and males tend to get it at an older age. Um, and I said these people were refractory. They were people who had already been treated with all kinds of different things. Um, half the people had been on at least three different drugs. You had to have been on at least two. Um, and then. Some of them were getting IVIG chronically. Um, Two-thirds of them had had it at some point. Um, so these people were, were, you know, have been experienced in getting lots of treatment for their myasthenia already. Half, sorry, half of them had already undergone a, uh, a thymectomy as well. So here's what happened in the study. So we used these different outcome measures. One of them is called the Myasthenia Gravis Activities of Daily Living Score. In a, in a busy clinic, this is the one that we like to use because it's easy, it's fast, the patient, this is a, called a patient reported outcome measure. We ask the patient a question, or we, uh, how have they been doing over the last couple of weeks? How has your swallowing been over the last couple of weeks? How has your speech been over the last couple of weeks? And um, so it's really fast. The other outcome measure that we'll talk about, I, th I think it might be one of these other slides, called the QMG, is a lot more labor intensive. It actually involves like timing, how, pe how long somebody can hold their arms up or hold their leg up or that kind of thing. It takes a lot more time. It's not really practical to do every single day in the clinic. Um, the other one that we use a lot in our clinic is, is called the quality of life score. We just give this to the patient and say, how much is the disease impacting you? There are 15 questions. Um, but with the activities of daily living score, I have a saying that if the, if the score changes by one point, it probably doesn't mean anything. If it changes by two points, it probably means something. 
If it changes by three points, it definitely means something. And on average here, there was more than a two-point change in the, in the myasthenia gravis activities of daily living score compared to the placebo over that 26 weeks. It happened pretty fast, and, and this is a theme I'm going to come back to a little bit, that they separated out pretty early, and then the, the separation stayed about the same. And the good news for the, peop the poor people who were for six months getting placebo, if they were patient enough, and all of them were, uh, to wait until the second half, they immediately had the, the benefit from the drug. Like right away, the same thing that we saw here, they got better. These people who were on placebo, now they got better right away too. And then they were basically did the same as the people who've been on Celeris all along. Um, so the delayed people didn't lose out by, by having to wait. And we look at these differences in, in the, how many points did that scale improve on that ADL score? Did it improve by at least three, by at least four, by at least five? And almost every one of these levels, there was an absolute difference of 20% compared to the placebo patients, which is good. We, we call this a number needed to treat, and it, and it means you had to treat five people to shift somebody into that, that category. If 20, there's a 20% difference between these, and, and that is a good number. It's like if we had to treat 100 people to shift one person, you're spending a lot of money, you're not getting much bang for your buck. But if, if you can treat only five people and shift somebody into one of these categories, that's, that's worthwhile. Um, so every drug has some downside. And in the case of Celeris and the other drugs that are going to be in this category called complement inhibitor drugs, it is this risk of meningococcus. Meningococcus causes meningitis. So it's a bacteria that causes meningitis. I said at the beginning, Complement is, is this part of your immune system that kills certain bacteria, and specifically ones that have a capsule around them. They're harder for your immune system to get rid of. You really need this complement system to do that. And so if you're blocking it, it's not going to effectively fight them. So how do you help with that? You vaccinate them. So we've been fighting the battle now that uh, pharmacies and insurance companies and things like that didn't get it that these people are getting ready to go on a drug that inhibits complement, and they're like, no, 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 we only give a meningitis vaccine to people who are, to college students, you know, that uh, everybody would get a, a meningitis vaccine when they're in college because it's a it's transmissible disease, but we have to say, no, this person is about to go on a complement inhibitor drug, they need this. Um, so you got to get vaccinated. There's two different vaccines, and once you've gotten the vaccines, you have to wait two weeks, and then you can start the drug. Um, and in this case, it says that uh, basically if you responded, you continued to respond. Um, and this is the, this is the part that, that I think is also very good about this drug. If you're going to get better, you get better right away. And, it, and you could see that in the study that they separated out from the placebo people. And people who aren't going to get better um, don't get better in that early time frame. And then you can, so you can make a decision, am I going to keep going? Uh, one of the things that I see too often is that somebody's been on treatment that's doing nothing for them, and nobody like says, well, let's move on and do something different. I see people who've been on steroids for years, and I'm like, did you ever get a response to the steroids? Nope, no, I never really got any better. And nobody ever said, well, let's just move on and try treating you with something different instead of the steroids. But in this case, you see that there's, they, they separated people out who did respond and people who didn't respond, and this is... Um, you, you can see that, that there's a huge difference in their average change in, their, in the scores, okay? And um, they looked at this, sorry, um, I guess right here, I didn't, I didn't put on this slide, but it, it was something that happened right away, very, very early. Okay, here it is. I knew it was on here somewhere. So for the patients who responded to Celeris, the response is usually achieved by 12 weeks, and in fact, what I've seen, you get Celeris in a loading dose. So you get uh, five treatments the first month um, that are a week apart, and then after that it's every two weeks. What I've seen is by the second maintenance dose, so now you've gotten seven doses, you're at two months of treatment, you're going to get better if you're going to get better. It pretty much has happened by then. And if it hasn't happened by then, you're probably not going to get better. So, um, so that's what I, I look at with patients.
there's, so it's every other week infusion. What's the problem with that? Well, some insurances, Medicare, um, won't let people get home infusions without a huge copay of 20%. And if you've got a very expensive drug, nobody can afford a 20% copay. Um, so you have to go to an infusion facility to get it. Um, and every other week, having to go to an infusion facility to get it is a pain in the neck. So a competitor drug came along. Uh, this other company called Ra Pharma, and theirs is a little bit different. It's not a monoclonal antibody. It's a different kind of a chemical. Um, it, it is targeting the same exact part of the pathway in the complement, that C5 thing that's one of the key steps. And they've done a study, which I'll show you here. Um, and they've shown in this small study, there were, I think, about 45 patients total in this study. Um, there were three groups, actually, in their study, uh, uh, the placebo, a low-dose, and a high-dose group. But basically, this is what they call a proof of concept. It looks like the drug is going to work, and it's a good idea to keep going to the next step. And that's about to happen now for this drug. They're getting ready to do the big study. They're, they're sort of gearing up to have their next level. And they're actually interested in trying it in people who are not necessarily refractory. They're, they're looking at people who are earlier in the, in the process. Um, one of the other things is that um, Alexion, the people who make Soliris, know this is happening and say, well, we have to do something to try to make our drug better to be more competitive. So there's a new form of the drug called Ultimiris instead of Soliris, but it's basically doing the same thing, but it only has to be infused once every eight weeks. So instead of going every two weeks to the infusion facility, you got to go every two months to the facility. That's a huge difference. Um, so um, it's already been shown in, in these other autoimmune diseases where Soliris works that this works as well. So um, that study is also getting ready to start right now for the Ultimiris in myasthenia gravis patients. Um, and this is just, I was saying before, that, that they were studying people who were a little bit earlier. Some of the patients um, were only class two myasthenics. Some of them had, had not had their disease quite as long. They had people who were almost brand new, 0 0.1 year, okay? Like one tenth of a year for some of the people, 1.6 year uh, in, in some of the other half a year here. So people who hadn't already been treated with all kinds of different drugs were in, were in their study too. When, that, when they first said they were going to do that, I thought that might have been a mistake, but so far it looks like it might, it might be okay. Um, so let's see here. I think, oh, and then they, they kind of looked at this to say, okay, how does this compare to the, the Soliris uh, patients? And basically, um, this, is, this is Soliris, this is their, their drug, and they're look, saying the percent of the patients who, um, who got down to almost normal, so a score of zero or one on that. Zero is totally normal on that score, um, and the percentage of people who got down to a zero or a one was very comparable. Now, these, their numbers are a lot smaller, this is 125 patients, okay, uh, and this is, you know, 30 patients or so, or so 60-some patients here, half as many here. So we'll, we'll see if this holds up. Hopefully it will. Um, so the real exciting stuff happening with the complement pathway, and now I want to make sure I leave enough time for her to go over the uh, FCRM pathway, and then after she finishes, then we'll both take some questions from you guys, so... Oh, and this is just one more, that 20% that difference that we saw with Soliris. I think maybe because the numbers are smaller here, the differences weren't quite as dra dramatic like at every single level in this score, but we'll see how that pans out in a bigger study. You can't read too much into this. Okay. Um, insurance companies are not... Letting people do this early, you have to fail some other treatments first. And I, I kind of understand it because they're very expensive. So, um, all right. All right. Can everybody hear me?
All right, so I wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for inviting me and especially to Ms. Law. So just as a few uh, disclosures here, number one is that none of these therapies that I'm about to discuss is currently FDA approved. So these are all drugs that are still in clinical development. They're at different stages of clinical development and many of them have ongoing studies which I will let you know about as well. Other thing that you should know is that I am a consultant for UCB. So the idea here is that there's a number of compounds that are currently in development for targeting FCRN. And I'm going to explain in a minute what FCRN is. But as you may have noticed, there's a number of tables outside. And a lot of these logos are going to be familiar to you. The two that are currently the furthest along in development are the Arginex product and the UCB product. And so we'll go into a little bit more detail about both of these, but the key difference between the two is that one is an intravenous infusion and the other one is a subcutaneous infusion. And so now getting into what exactly does FCRN do? So if we look up here, these are just general antibodies. So these are all the little immune globulins that are circulating in the circulatory system. And so what happens is, a cell, there's a number of discussions about what type of cell this is, but for ease of understanding, let's say cells along the walls of blood vessels. What they do is they sort of sample the environment around them, sort of like taking a little taste. And so they scoop up some of that, and then there's a molecule inside called FCRN right here. And what he does is he essentially binds to the immune globulin that has been sampled. And what this does is this is almost like a zip code for the cell in the sense that it tells the cell where do I need to send this bound antibody and receptor complex. And so what happens is antibodies that are bound to the FCRN receptor, the IgGs, they get sent back out into the bloodstream. Yes. Oh, sorry. And then the ones that are not Bound. So, for example, these that don't have the little blue guy on them, they get routed into the pathway where they get degraded. So they're basically taken out of the circulation. And so the way that these compounds work primarily is that they block the ability of FCRN to bind to the antibody that's been taken in from outside the cell. And so what this does is this means that you have less antibodies that can be sent back out into circulation and they all get routed to the pathway where they get degraded. So essentially you're reducing the amount of circulating IgG and therefore you have less IgG and less acetylcholine receptor antibody that can bind to the receptor and cause the blockade. And so getting into the first compound, this is exactly how the compound developed by Arginex, which is called Fgartigimod. These don't have any proprietary names just yet, given their stage in development. And so this works in exactly the, the way you would expect. What happens is the antibodies come in. Imagine these are the acetylcholine receptor antibodies. You have the compound here as well that comes in with it. The compound binds to the FCRN, so then the FCRN cannot bind to the IgG, and then it gets sent to be destroyed. So it doesn't come back out into circulation. And this particular drug completed a phase two study, which is sort of the study that shows, hey, this really does work in myasthenia. And so what this study was is this was a relatively small study. This was only 24 patients, and, but they were patients who had generalized myasthenia gravis. And as you'll see from here, there were two main groups for treatment. You had patients who were maintained on whatever they were currently receiving for myasthenia, and then you had patients who received drug, and they were compared against patients who received placebo. They each, in each group, you had four doses, and then there was a follow-up period of about eight weeks. And here they're basically trying to demonstrate that, hey, does this really work? And so what they found is that it's incredibly well tolerated. The biggest side effect that was reported was that it caused a bit of headache. And in most cases, 
that headache was not a significant deal and didn't really result in patients being taken out of the trial. And so what did this show? What were the results of this study? What, these, what this study showed is that you do get a reduction in IgG, and that reduction in IgG does, in fact, correlate and correspond to improvements in the QMG score, which is the one that Dr. Pulley mentioned is sort of time intensive to do. You can't necessarily do it every single clinic visit. But they also found that this improves the MGADL score, which is kind of that quick, in, that quick patient reported outcome that Dr. Pulley was talking about. And these results are appearing quite early. If you look at it, this is the first dose. And even as far as there, you're starting to get, see a reduction of at least of about two in the, do, in the group that received drug. And so this was pretty consistent across both groups. And so if you look at it in a little bit more detail, moving through the rest of the study, this is at the end of that dosing period, so after that fourth dose. And then the response is still there even two weeks after dosing. So this doesn't go away even though you've stopped getting drug, which is very nice. And then this is kind of the other big finding was that all of the outcome measures that they looked at, so you have the MGADL, which is sort of the quick one that you can do easily in clinic. You have the QMG, which is a little bit more time intensive. The quality of life score, which is also something that's very reflective of what the patient is actually experiencing. And then the MG composite, which is a combination of both clinician assessed exam items as well as patient reported symptoms. All of these demonstrated a sustained response even after the IgG levels started going back up, which is a pretty compelling argument. And all in all, looking through, by the time the study was said and done, over six weeks after the patients had received drug, 75% of them were still doing well and still had reductions in the MGADL scores. And so what this study showed us, which this was sort of the small number of patients, only 24, but it showed us that this drug is safe, it's well tolerated, and it works fast, and the effect is it endures. And so those are you know, very attractive qualities in a drug that you're looking at for a condition like myasthenia gravis, where a lot of the treatments we have take a while to really show a benefit. And so now, currently, the phase two study is done, so now they're recruiting patients for the phase three study, which is a much larger study. And so I think they're outside if there's any questions relating to the study specifics. Pardon? And then the next drug that's a little bit further in development is a drug that's produced by UCB. It's called rosinolizumab, which is a mouthful <laughs> to say. And this one, the key difference between it is that it's administered subcutaneously. And so it's a much smaller infusion volume and can be given much, in a much shorter time frame. And this works in the same way, it basically blocks the ability to recycle the IgG, and so you get rid of it. And this is currently in development to look at a number of different diseases that, not just myasthenia. So they're looking at this in myasthenia, they're looking at this in some blood disorders, they're also looking at it in a few other neurologic indications, specifically CIDP. Other thing that's important here is that this is a product that is not derived from human blood. Again, this is made by cells that are making, in petri dishes, that are making very specific antibodies. And so this, they just, com they completed their phase two study last year. And so this looked at 43 patients who had moderate to severe myasthenia. And what they did was they had two kind of, they had two dosing periods. So in the first dosing period, Right here, you had patients who were randomized to either receive the drug or they, were, or they received a placebo. They were maintained on 
the therapy that they were already receiving. So that was kept the same. And then after the dosing period, which was four weeks, they were re-randomized. So in that process, they, after that, in the second dosing period, they received either seven milligrams or they received four milligrams per kilogram of the medication. And that continued for three weeks. And then following that, there was an eight-week follow-up period where they continued to monitor the patients. And what did they find? So the full study results are not released yet, but based on what they did release in October, they found that there was a pretty notable improvement in the um, group that received treatment versus the group that received placebo. So what they found overall is that the QMG went down in the first dosing period, so that was relatively early. The MG composite score went down and the MG ADL score went down. And what they found is that just in this short four week period where patients were receiving either drug or a placebo, that you had an improvement in the MG ADL of two which is pretty notable and pretty impressive. And then if you look at dosing period two, all of these continued to spread out and differentiate even more. And by the time all was said and done, when they looked at this in participants who had received the higher dose in both, the, in both dosing periods, they found an overall reduction of about 68% in the circulating immune globulins and in the acetylcholine antibodies. And so where is this now? So they are initiating a phase three program. It's not yet recruiting, but they do have information available as to which sites are likely to be involved. So they'll have more information about that at their table outside so they can give you more about that. And then there's two other compounds that I just wanted to mention that are also currently in development. And both of these groups are also here so they can give you more details. But Momenta has a compound that is currently recruiting for phase two studies. So these are the smaller studies where they're trying to show that yes, this truly does work in this disease process. And then their phase one study, which was their initial study, showed that you had a reduction in IgG of 84%, which is, again, quite a bit. And then the final one is the Immunovant product They've completed phase one. They're working on getting phase two started, but it's not quite ready for recruitment. And so bottom line, these are a completely new target for myasthenia gravis therapies, and there's a lot of competition in this area. There's four compounds that are currently in development, which is a lot, especially for a rare disease. And we're, they're also exploring two different delivery mechanisms, which is key. One, an intravenous, where you would probably have to get it via an infusion center or via home infusion. The other one being a subcutaneous infusion, which has the potential to be something that could be self-administered. And the other key thing about this is, given the similarities in the overall mechanism and the effect, these are potential therapies for patients who cannot receive IVIG or plasma exchange. So it opens up a whole new avenue of therapy 